And I, I just want to say how blessed I am to, to not just be in the midst of you all today, but just to even have the grace to be able to, to share a word or two from the Lord today. Um, I just am very thankful for what I feel uh, is, is like a new lease on life, not just for me, but for my family here. We, we were all sick, you know, at some point. And, um, but it's amazing how good our God reveals himself to be. Just when we thought that we, we knew how good he was, he surprises us again and again. I wanna to continue to just uh, um, encourage you all to remain steadfast. Don't let him go. I'm telling you, don't let him go. Don't be spasmodic in your uh, 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 you know, relationship with him. Don't hold on to him now and then let him go and then hold on to him. Be consistent because uh, if the time hasn't come, the time will come when you will realize how badly you need him. Uh, uh, parents, give a good example to your children of what it means to be a Christian. Be steadfast in that, you know? Sometimes they may go, they may come and go. Sometimes they may look like, you know, they, they're not listening to you and all that, but you be consistent because uh, when they grow older, they will have something to relate to and they will have an idea of what it means to be steadfast. You know, their idea of what a Christian is is gonna come uh, directly from the example that you are giving them today. And we can't afford just to be lax in our, our walk with God. We got to be consistent. So I wanna encourage us to do that, okay? Um, this morning, I'm going to be speaking to you uh, about uh, the holy line, the holy line from Adam down to the end of time, okay? And um, uh, we're going to take a look uh, and trace through Bible history, the descendants of the Holy Line, the preservers of the knowledge and of the true faith, the progenitors uh, of the promised Messiah from the time of Adam all the way to the time in which we're living down to the end of time. So we're going to be doing that. And I'm going to need God's grace, his help and his spirit. And so I invite you to just bow your heads real quickly with me. Father in heaven, oh Lord, I just need you so much today. Um, I need your spirit to rest upon me so that I can, I can relate and I can tell the story to the church as I have seen it, as you've shown, shown it to me. I want to be able to tell it to them. And Lord, I remember how you blessed um, uh, Stephen, who was able to tell the story of Christ all the way from the time of Moses, all the way to the time in which they were living. And, 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 and I realized that that cannot happen without your spirit. I've already prayed for it, but I publicly here implore you once again to bless me, to bless the church. And uh, Lord, uh, so that the story is, is interesting uh, the, the, we, they can relate to it as we go up from uh, point to point. We pray. We thank you because I know that you've heard our, our prayer and you will grant as we have asked. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the holy line, uh, the preservers of the true faith, the, of the knowledge of God, all the way from the time of Adam down to our time, uh, God always has had people to preserve the knowledge of God, his knowledge, and to communicate it from one generation to the other. We're going to see that. We're also going to see that as we trace it, how the enemy has waged relentless warfare on uh, this uh, line. Uh, he doesn't stop. He um, he, he has been angry all the way from the beginning. And uh, he, you know, it, it's, it, as we go through our own experiences, uh, all of us, I'm sure, uh, are, are tempted. We are persecuted. We go through trials, whether that happens in your own home, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in relationships with families, whether it's in any kind of vicissitudes that we go through through life, whether it's in sickness, trials, uh, whatever it is, it's important that these things are kept before us so that we, lest we come to think that we are alone 
or outliers when it comes to this battle. It's very easy when you're persecuted and when you're going through hardship to feel that you are alone, but you're not. Amen. Uh, we know the story, and so I'm just going to be touching from point to point uh, here as we go along, and I hope for you to see a picture. Okay. Um, Adam, of course, was created by God, as we know, and um, to Adam and his wife Eve, um, the first son by the name of Cain was born, and uh, not too long after that, uh, the, his younger brother was born by the name of Abel. We know the story. Cain was disobedient, Abel was obedient. And uh, as it has always been, the disobedient always persecute the obedient. The disobedient always are jealous and envious of the obedient. And so we have that baleful example at the very beginning of time when Cain, we read in the Bible that he killed his brother Abel. Now, <clears throat> I want you to always, at the back of everything that happens, whether it's the holy line uh, or, the, or, the, or the counterfeit that uh, the devil has always side by side, to see the powers that are behind them. Behind Abel, Cain, obviously the devil was there. He was wroth and, uh, and when he heard the story, the promise of the Messiah that would come to crush his head. And he was determined to make sure that that does not happen. And so he saw that that was gonna be fulfilled in Abel. And so he instigated his brother Cain to kill him. That was the holy line. And for, so for the time being, uh, you know, there wasn't anyone to communicate uh, the, the knowledge and preserve the knowledge of God from that generation to the next. But we read that uh, not too long afterward, uh, God gave uh, Adam and Eve another son, and his name was Seth. And the Bible tells us that from that time on now, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. The reason why the Bible says that is that from the time Abel was killed, with the exception of his father, uh, as far as the boys are, 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 are concerned, Cain wasn't interested in God. He was just interested in himself. And from Cain, we have that unholy line that the Bible calls the sons of men. And from Seth, we have the other line that is the holy line that the Bible calls the sons of God. And so for a while, you had those two, uh, those two lines, distinct lines that would separate the sons of God from Seth and the sons of men or man from Cain. They remain distinct and separate for a long time. In fact, they live in different areas. But the time came uh, when around the times of, um, you know, by the time you come to the time of Enoch and Methuselah and Lamech and then Noah, uh, the sons of God begin to form unions or marriages with the sons of, of men. In other words, the line of Seth began to intermarry with the line of Cain. Now, this is something that God has always forbidden. And so, through in a marriage with them, uh, the uh, holy line began to be corrupted. Now, of course, this was Satan's uh, plan. Now, I want you to know that wherever you see the counterfeit, it always exists to war against the real deal and to uh, 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 overwhelm it and eliminate it. Satan is not playing just to win in the end and say, you know, I won. He, his determined uh, 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 efforts are aimed towards annihilating totally the holy line. And we, I hope we can see that as we follow the story here. So you get down to the time of Noah and there's only a few people that are uh, uh, obedient to God, a few people that are preserving that knowledge. Now God saw that if he allowed the world to continue, uh, his people, the holy line, would be completely eliminated. And so he determined to destroy the world by a flood. By the time Noah completes building the ark, there is only one man that is holy in all the world. He and his family. And so God preserves them. Imagine just this one man is left. You know, of course, Methuselah and, uh, and everybody else, you know, they were holy, but they had died sometime before the flood. And so the flood comes, and on the other side of the flood, we find Noah with three boys, 
Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And out of those three boys, one boy by the name of Shem was chosen by God or seen faithful by God to continue this holy line that was following from the beginning of time to the end, uh, 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 to the end of time. So out of Shem, later on, um, a man by the name of Abraham is called by God. And Abraham because, becomes now, uh, is going to become the father of the faithful. Abraham now begins the period of time in the Bible called the time of the patriarchs. From Abraham, we have, of course, Isaac. And Isaac gives birth to two boys. And of those two boys, Jacob is, uh, uh, is chosen to be the holy line. And of course, out of Jacob, we have the 12 patriarchs that we call the 12 sons of, um, of Israel. Now, um, from uh, the uh, time of uh, 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 Israel or Jacob, um, we have uh, the 12 boys were born and we know the story of, of uh, uh, Joseph and how he ends up in uh, 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 Egypt, and not too long afterward, um, 70 souls, including his own father, Israel, end up in Egypt. 400 years transpire, which brings us to the time when Moses was called to come call the children of Israel out of Egypt. And right when Moses, about the time of when Moses is born, Satan again makes another desperate attempt to wipe out this holy line, and he moves upon Pharaoh to destroy all the males, male children, in order to destroy this holy line. It's an interesting read. If you go to the book of Exodus, we're not going to go there right now. I'm just going to give references as we go along the way. But he moves upon Pharaoh now, uh, gives issues a command to all the midwives to destroy all the baby boys. When a child is born, if it's a boy, kill it. If it's a girl, let it live. And the Bible says that the midwives, Egyptian midwives, feared God. And they did not do what Pharaoh told them. They let the boys live. And so soon, you know, we know that Pharaoh gets angry. How come you're not killing them? And of course, they lie about it, which is understandable if you're heathen. And they said, no, you know, by the time we get there to, you know, they, when, they're, when they're in labor, these uh, 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 Israelite women, they're very strong. They've given birth already. They don't even need us. And that's how, you know, we're not able to kill their children. The Bible says because God, because they honored God and they feared him, the midwives, God made, gave them a name and he blessed their households. You see, our God is a good God. He doesn't care what you profess. He doesn't care where you're coming from. If you obey him, wherever you are, he will bless you as he blessed those midwives. Now, um, so uh, at the time, about the time when Joseph went to Egypt, Judah, one of the 12 patriarchs, um, had two children, and those two boys uh, were uh, Perez and Zira. Perez and Zira. You see, when uh, Israel was dying, he, uh, Jacob was dying. He had been shown by God that Judah would be the, was the one chosen to continue that holy line that would introduce to the world the Messiah that was promised in the book of Genesis. So he has these two boys, Perez. And zero. And out of Pharaoh, he has Hezron, he has Ram, and then there's a man by the name of Aminadab coming down the line of Judah now. And out of Aminadab, he had this young boy whose name was Salmon. And Salmon uh, is the man now who married Rahab, the prostitute that was saved out of Jericho. Now, out of the union of, of Salmon and Rahab, these two people, now Rahab the prostitute and Salmon, they gave birth to a little boy whose name was Boaz. Boaz married a little girl, a young girl, who was a Moabitess woman whose name was Ruth. And both Boaz and Ruth now uh, uh, give birth to Obed, who now then in turn uh, is the father of Jesse, who in turn is the father of David, the beloved king of Israel. Now you see, the Messiah is called the son of David because David was the man chosen now to 
uh, be that prominent figure at the top of that tree out of which the Messiah would come from. But I'd like to continue the story here uh, with the story of David uh, and tell you some very interesting things here as we follow this line and as we can see how God is determined to preserve them and how the devil, on the other hand, is determined to destroy and an annihilate them. Now, um, out of Dave, uh, uh, David, of course, uh, we know that he had some seven wives. Of all those seven wives, God chose because uh, of the um, David's fall, sin, and genuine heartfelt repentance. Watch this now. There's hope for all of us. God chooses out of all those women that David married, one called Bathsheba, to give birth to a baby boy whose name was Solomon. Solomon is the one chosen by God, whose mother was Bathsheba, to continue that holy line. Now, you know, the Bible asks an interesting question in Job. Who can bring an, a, a clean thing out of an unclean? Well, the answer, of course, is only God can do that. Only God can take you and I, as sinful as we have been, and make us clean. You see, my friends, God doesn't care where you're coming from. He doesn't care. He doesn't seem to be overwhelmed with the multiplicity uh, of our sins and iniquities. He can take something that is ugly, and I'm talking about this morally now, and make it into a beautiful specimen of Christianity. As, can, as demonstrated now, Bathsheba gives birth to Solomon. And Solomon is, of course, that wise king who wrote all of those thousands of Proverbs, all those songs. And um, Solomon, a son's name was Rehoboam. Rehoboam is the man who came on the throne and who, during whose time the tribes of Israel was split into two. That great apostasy that ended up or resulted in the splitting up of, the two, of Israel into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah and Benjamin and the northern tribes, the 10 tribes happened during the time of Rehoboam. Now, Rehoboam then dies, and he gives birth to um, Abijah. Abijah, in turn, is the father of Asa, the king of Israel. Asa is the father of a prominent king whose name was Jehoshaphat. I want to talk to you about a little bit about Jehoshaphat, because Jehoshaphat is an incredibly good king, but just like his father David, Jehoshaphat did something that tarnished his good history. His, the picture that we have would have been perfect had it not been for one thing that he, he did. You see, Jehoshaphat um, consented or allowed his son Jehoram, listen to this now, to marry Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. Her name was Athaliah. Now watch this now. You got two tribes. You got the 10 tribes and you have Judah. God wants Judah now to be the holy line. This is where the Messiah is going to come from. But the devil knows that and he has determined that it's not going to happen. So what happens? Satan moves upon Jehoshaphat to allow his son Jehoram to marry Jezebel and Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. Now this Athaliah was a wicked, was as wicked as was her mother. And through this union, now, um, there, was, there was formed an alliance between now Judah and the 10 tribes and Israel. Whenever you hear Judah, the other one, 10 tribes are always referred to in the Bible as Israel. Okay? Now, Jehoshaphat became friends with Ahab. Some of us have read the story when he goes down there and he's visiting, and while visiting down there, Ahab says, you know, I'm about to go to war. You know, can you join me? And Jehoshaphat rashly says, oh, you know, I'm, we're one. We're related now, you know, so we're together. I'll, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. And then he realizes after he makes the promise that they were actually going to go to war together. And so he said, you know, yeah, Jehoshaphat, I'll say, well, we can't just go to war without asking God. Ahab's thinking, what God? You know, he's got all these 400 prophets who come in and they're prophets of Baal and they all lie about it. You know, Jehoshaphat is trying to ex 
extricate him, himself out of this alliance, this promise that he has made. And so Micaiah is the only prophet of God in that um, uh, uh, court. And he is in some dungeon somewhere because Ahab says, I hate him. He never says anything good about me. And so they go to war together. And this union now is formed that begins to contaminate not only the fair record of Jehoshaphat, but also this holy line of Judah that God is trying to preserve, okay? Uh, Jehoshaphat later on, of course, dies. And uh, Jehoram, the husband of Athaliah, is the king now. As soon as Jehoram is, uh, becomes king, um, he, listen to this, he kills all his brothers. Interesting. He kills all of his brothers and there's none left. And so now, as soon as he comes in the throne and he does that, not too long after that, God inspires the Philistines and the Arabians. They attack the kingdom of Judah and they kill all of Jehoram's sons. See, he kills his brothers, and then the Arabians come in and they kill all of his children, except one, the youngest, okay? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, kills all of them. And when they kill all of them, um, Jehoram continues to reign. God is angry at him, and of course, and he smites him with a very, very incurable disease and all of that, and then he dies. Once he dies, Athaliah, when he realizes that Jehoram is dead, arises and destroys all the holy seed in Judah. Every single eligible person to the throne of David was killed. The holy line is in trouble. That is except one little boy who was one year old. This is Athaliah killing her grandchildren, great-grandchildren, all of them, kills them. But the high priest's wife, is, her name is Joshabeth. She saves one little baby whose name was Joash. Okay? She says, you know what? I can't allow this to happen. I'm going to have to save this one little kid. He's one year old. Joash runs off with him, and she goes into the temple of God and hides him there, one year old. They hide him there, both her and her husband, uh, for six years until he's seven years old. Athaliah, meanwhile, is reigning in Israel. Now follow me carefully. This is the kingdom of Judah. The daughter of Jezebel is reigning in Judah. Okay? And meanwhile, Jezebel is over on the other kingdom. This is a devil. This is what he wants to do. It's just like today. The infiltration you hear from the Jesuits and all of that is all about that. Now, after about six years, Joshabeth and her husband bring out the little baby. He's seven years old. I don't know. Carmina, how old is uh, Chrysander? Nine. He's nine. Okay. Now, I want you to imagine when someone younger than Chrysander... <laughs> Two years younger than Chrysander, that's when uh, little Joash became king. How old is, is, do we have a seven-year-old child anywhere? Can we think of a seven-year-old among all the children? Uh, Alyssa, Alyssa's seven years old. She's a, okay, 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 okay. Put your hand up. I want everyone to see, okay. Now I want you to picture her becoming queen today or being elected president of the United States. I, I want you to picture that. But my friends, Joash was the only hope. There was only one child. There was a time in Bible history when there was only one person. Forget about the remnant. You had one person that is going to preserve. That is the one seed through which the Messiah will come out. How easy it is for the devil to kill him. But God has him hidden in the temple. Now, what's going to happen now? Uh... Joash, and by the way, I need to go back a little bit. His father, um, Joram, goes to visit 
his in-laws over there in, uh, you know, goes to visit Ahab, uh, actually, no, uh, uh, Je Jehoram goes to visit Joram. Okay, this is his uncle over in the other kingdom, goes to visit. So this is the king of Judah going to visit the king of Israel. Now remember, God did not want these two kingdoms commingling together. And while he goes down there visiting Joram, they're sitting there talking to his uncle, just how, how is everything going? Uh, Joram says, you know, what Joram says, you know, uh, uh, Joram says, you know, I'm troubled. Have you heard about this one guy? His name, of, his name was Jehu. And this Jehu, man, he has murdered our whole family. And, 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 you know, he's just murdered everyone. In fact, there's only just a few of us left. And I'm thinking of going to attack him. You want to go with me? And Jehoram says, yeah, let's do that. For those of you who don't know, Jehu was anointed by Elisha. Okay? And God says specifically, I want you to anoint him. And I want, you, I want him to destroy the whole house of Ahab. Don't leave anyone that breathes. And so this was God's special mission that Jehu was actually carrying out when, Je, when Joram said to Jehoram, let's go attack him. Let's go find this guy. And so while they're on their way going out there, Jehu meets them. And of course, he kills them both. <laughs> now they're dead. Okay, this is when now uh, his grandmother, Athaliah, arises, uh, uh, you know, his wife arises, Athaliah, and destroys everyone and leaves just Joash. Now let's talk about Joash a little bit because Joash now um, uh, is, is, you know, he's inaugurated as king, uh, as we have seen at seven years old. Athaliah just loses it completely. And she comes out, she says, treason, treason. The high priest says, sends a couple of men, he says, go get her where she's standing right there and kill her. And so Athaliah is brought to an end. That was the last remaining uh, a family of the house of Jezebel and Ahab. That's how they perished. But now we have Josiah, seven years old. He begins to reign. He becomes the father of Amaziah. Amaziah now, uh, uh, gives, uh, brings forth a baby boy by the name of Uzziah. We all know King Uzziah. He was a great king. Okay, you can. Uh, 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 king Uzziah is the father of King um, uh, uh, Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the man who got sick and he prayed and God granted him 15 years. This is the holy line now. Holy line coming on. And King Hezekiah in the Book of Chronicles have four chapters because of all the good things that this king did. And we know that he prayed to God, God gave him, added him 15 more years. It was during those 15 years that his wife gave birth to a baby boy named Manasseh. And Manasseh was as wicked as King Hezekiah was good. Manasseh was more wicked than any king before him. Amen? I've said this before and it bears repeating. Sometimes we don't know what's best. Sometimes someone maybe gets really sick and we just go out there and we pray. We just want God to, 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 to save this person. I mean, I was sick a couple of days, so I know this. You know, we just want God to pray. When we pray and we ask God to, to save a person without asking, Lord, this is what we see, but you know the hearts of all men. You know what? If this will be, bring glory to you and it will be a blessing to them, we're asking simply that you save you, uh, uh, you, you heal this person. We always have to add, if not our will, but your will, because God sees the end from the beginning, which you and I sometimes do not see. It is not a lack of faith when we pray for people and we say, Lord, nevertheless, not as we will, but your will be done, even when we pray for ourselves. So Manasseh now is born during this 15 bonus years, and he becomes the most wicked king ever known in Israel. The nation, as well as uh, a posterity, would have been spared this had Hezekiah just said, you know what, Lord, you know, uh, you told me to set my house in order. That's what I'm going to do. If he had been selfless in that particular respect, the world would have been saved. Um, this experience with Manasseh. Now, uh, moving on now, we got to move on. Manasseh, however, God, again, <laughs> as he only he can do. 
uh, can bring something good out of something bad because Manasseh was now the father of Josiah. And Josiah is another exceptionally good king uh, uh, in Bible history. He was the father of Jehoahaz and Jehoahaz was the one along with his brother that were reigning in Judah when King Nebuchadnezzar and his troops came to Jerusalem and besieged it and the captivity began at this time. We're moving on in our story here and I'm, I hope that you're finding it interesting. We're moving on. Now, um, after the Babylonian captivity, we're tracing now this holy line. Remember now, even when they went into captivity, it was Satan's uh, purpose to um, uh, basically overwhelm the holy seed and corrupt it so that there would be nothing left. That's why when you see Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego come to Babylon, the first thing King Nebuchadnezzar does, he changes their names. He assigns them me uh, food to eat. He wants them to eat the king's food. He wants them to drink the king's wine. He changes their name. What is he trying to do? Or rather, what is Satan trying to do through this heathen king? He is trying to overwhelm and completely obliterate this holy line. But God is good. He has said, no, when you go out there, pray for that kingdom. If, if they have peace, you will have peace. Don't fight against it. God has said, you're going to be there for 70 years. You know, our God is good. You'll be there for 70 years. So hold on. When God gives us time, it's so that we can have hope. And so through men like uh, uh, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Daniel at their head, God preserves this holy line. When Cyrus at last gives the permission for people to go back, the freedom for them to go back, only a remnant goes out. And on the other side of the remnant, we have a man by the name of Zerubbabel. You've heard of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the great grandson of Josiah, the king. And along with him, you have Joshua and these, and you have Ezra and you have Nehemiah, and these are the great builders of the wall. We all, we all know about all of the vicissitudes and all the trials and persecutions that these men went through, but it is this through the same theme of God trying to carry out his work, his purpose until the Messiah is born. And of course, the devil on the other hand, fighting, making sure that this will not happen. But we can see God's, you know, truth and God's purpose is on the march. And though frustrated, though delayed, it is undeviating on its way to the point uh, uh, of fruition that God has purposed. So we have Zerubbabel. About 50 to 60 years later, we, uh, the Bible introduces us to a man by the name of Mordecai and a little girl by the name of Esther. Okay, now Esther and Mordecai, we know the story there. We know that in the story of Esther and, and Mordecai, we have the preservers of God's truth. We have people like Mordecai who will not bow down to Haman at the gate. Everybody else is doing what Haman says, but Mordecai will not do it. But as uh, Haman begins to interview different people, he's told, oh no, he's not alone. There are other people like him. Just like in the times of Elijah, you know, uh, God said to Elijah, oh, no, 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 no. There are 7,000, Elijah, that you don't know about. And they, too, have not bowed down their knees to Baal, and their lips have not kissed him. And so there's always just this remnant, this holy line that God is preserving in ways that causes the devil to be amazed and to, uh, to come at his wit's end. He doesn't know what to do, but God somehow is preserving them. And as we read this, guys, I want you to know that God today is preserving you. You know, uh, the apostle Peter says, who are kept by the power of God, ready to be revealed in the last time. That's how we are kept. If it wasn't for God, we would be obliterated. If God were to turn away for a minute, you and I would cease to exist. Now, uh, so after the story of Mordecai and uh, Esther, uh, shortly after that, we have about, um, in the book of Haggai, we still have the remnant. In fact, if you read Haggai 1.14, we're told that when Haggai the prophet, along with uh, uh, Zechariah, 
those two prophets were sent to encourage the builders of the wall. Remember, they, you know, they became so persecuted, so much rubbish was thrown on the way. They finally went back home and everybody went back to their business. They forgot the Lord's work and the, 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 the work was sitting there in ruins. Nobody was working, but they were taking care of their business. Haggai and Zechariah were sent to them. And in response to that, Zerubbabel, and we have Joshua, and we're told in verse 14 of chapter one of Haggai that, and they were the remnant helping them. In the book of Nehemiah, we're told it was the prophets helping them. You see the remnant and the prophets are synonymous. We're gonna see this in a little bit. Moving on in our uh, narrative here. Uh, so after that period, you have about 400 years of silence, 400 years of silence. That is the period between Malachi and the book of Matthew. And the book of Matthew, of course, introduces us now for the first time, the Messiah, the long awaited Messiah is at last born. After all this happening, sometimes only one person left, you know, hanging on the balance, you know, that this whole, uh, a mission, this whole idea, this whole line hanging on the balance at sometimes you know what the Messiah at last was born. And when Jesus, our Lord was born, we know of course that he lived under the shadow of the cross from the manger all the way to the cross. He lived under his shadow. We know the story of Herod and how Satan instigated Herod again to kill all the little children in Bethlehem, two years old and under, in order to kill the Messiah in the process. It's the whole idea, the devil wanting to destroy and annihilate the Holy Seed and God's unfailing, unyielding efforts to preserve it. So Jesus, the little boy, we know that he, they have to run off to Egypt and there they live for a while and then they come back and then he's in Nazareth, you know, and then he's baptized at the age of 30. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but he's baptized, he goes to the wilderness, he returns from the wilderness, he goes to church on the Sabbath in Luke 4, 16, we read about it. And uh, further on in the chapter, after he announced himself to be the Messiah, you would think that people would be excited. The people in the church, okay, in the church, after they heard that, they looked at one another and they said, hmm, you know what we need to do here. They came out of the church and they took him to a brow of a hill and they were ready to push him over and kill him right there and then, even before his, 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 his mission was started. Go read it. It's God that saved him that day because his time was not there. If the death, if God would have allowed it, they would have, the Messiah would not have lived to even see the beginning of his mission. And so we read the story and we know how he was betrayed by Judas and how Peter denied him and how two kings got together and the, the you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were enemies became friends and they decided that he ought to die. And our Lord was put to death on the cross and he hung there for you and I, but thank God on the third day he rose again and he is in heaven now. And he offers now to come back and say, now I'm going to hold your hand. I have walked all the way. I know every bit of this way. I'm going to walk with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now we're following this all along as we're moving on. Um, so from, the, from the time of Jesus, we come to the time of the apostles, of course, and uh, the apostles, all of them, with the exception of John, the youngest of them, were all martyred, including Paul, the great apostle to the Gentiles. And it's not that they wouldn't have killed John. Tradition tells us that they tried to kill him, <laughs> okay, but he wouldn't die. So instead, they banished him to the Isle of Patmos. And there in the Isle of Patmos, he tells us, I, brother, who is both your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, I was in the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was banished there for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now we know the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. There's something about the spirit of prophecy that the devil hates so much that he actually put John away in the island in the Mediterranean because he doesn't want him shedding this light. Peter tells us that we have a more sure word 
of prophecy, that we, we do well to take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Peter is telling us, he's telling us, look, we were eyewitnesses. I and John and, and James, we were up in the mountain. We actually saw Jesus coming again. We saw the representation of his coming. We saw the transfiguration. We saw him glorified. We saw angels. We saw Moses. We saw uh, 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 Elijah, you know, representing those who are dead, who will rise again, and those who will be translated in the end. We saw all of that. And you and I would think that that is an amazing thing and it is but peter tells us wait a minute but we have an even more sure word of prophecy wow well even more than seeing the transfiguration he's saying wait a minute prophecy is even better than that why because it is a light that shines in a dark place now you see the devil hates light because he's the father of lies he loves darkness John was in the Isle of Patmos because of the spirit of prophecy and the word of God. See, the spirit of prophecy lights up the distant future. The wise man tells us where there is no vision, the people perish. We're continuing now here uh, in our narrative here. So we have the apostles, they're dead, they're gone, they're past the stage of action. And we come now to the period of 100 years uh, AD, uh, uh, where the great persecution starts from 100 AD all the way to some about 321 AD. Great persecution. There were emperors like Diocletian who promised that they were going to stamp out the Christian religion. And they just waged relentless warfare. If it hadn't been for God, I say to us again, there would be no such thing as a Christian today. There would be no such thing as anybody talking about, oh, you know, Christ is coming again, you know, nobody, you know, talking about the three angels message or anything like that. There would be no one. The fact that you and I are here today, we are standing on shoulders of faithful men and women who went through a lot to finally hand the baton to you and I today. And it is never easy. Imagine this, 100 AD, the 321, 200 years, man, oh man, I have sometimes, you know, you know, you've gone through something for about a month or two or a year or three and you start complaining. Imagine war and persecution relentlessly for 200 plus years. And so now 321 brings us to a great emperor. His name was Constantine. And what brought an end to the persecution is something called the pox Romana or the Roman peace. This is a time when Constantine became a Christian. Really, this is how the scripture puts it. You see, it's one thing how we see things, but it's quite another how God sees things. He describes this period by giving us a symbol, a symbol of a black horse of compromise. This period of peace was there because the Christianity compromised. And so now there is another, oh, 200 years about from 321 all the way to a notable year of 538 AD. 538 is notable because that is the institution of that great institution called the papacy. When that was instituted, that marked the beginning of the dark ages. And from 538 all the way to 1798, we are going to have a period of a relentless persecution of Christianity, one of determined annihilation of the Christian religion and of the Holy Seed as, it, as we know it. And so now during that time, the Huguenots, French Huguenots are going to be decimated. When I say decimated, I mean they were eliminated completely. Okay, the Dominican friars or the Dominican order of the Roman Catholic Church still today boasts itself for the annihilation of the French Huguenots. These were good people. And so now we have the Waldensian Christians. They are out there. They don't have any homes or anything like that. They, uh, they, some of them have their licenses to practice have been taken away. These were smart men and women and they spent their lives in the valleys of Piedmont where the, the, the winters are harsh 
and there and their children, they and their children made their home in those valleys. And from time to time, the Pope would send his armies and he would kill them in their thousands. But let me tell you, we owe a lot to that venerable group of people called the Waldensian Christians because they preserved not only the faith and the truth, but they preserved the Bible as we know it so that you and I can have it on this other side. I hope this is making sense to somebody. And so now, <coughs> when the Waldenses passed a stage of action, they passed the baton to a group of people uh, called the Reformers. And from John Wycliffe, whom uh, history calls the morning star of the Reformation. We had also John Huss, we had Jerome, we had John Calvin, we had Wesley, John and Charles, we have Zwingli, and then we have Luther. And Luther is the one that was chosen by God to spark off what is called the protest of the German princes that resulted in the Protestant Reformation that we know today. Now, that's why the whole idea of Protestantism is there. You and I owe so much to this protest than we even know. The fact that we even live in this country, many of us who have actually come and immigrated from other countries to this country, is we owe to the great Protestant Reformation. Why? Because this great nation right here was instituted by people who were running away from the persecution that we are just talking about of the dark ages. And when they came here, uh, even though it has not been perfect, it is a country that allowed people to come in and to practice their faith according to the dictates of their own conscience. Now we're told that close to the end of time, this country represented by a beast with lamb-like horns will speak as a dragon and take away the freedoms that you and I have enjoyed. We do well, we do well, my friends, to study the word of God. We do well to understand it well. We do well to commit whatever we can to memory. We do well to do that while we can because the baton has been passed to us. But now the question I have to ask now, and this is a section that I'd like to end with. What about our day? Where is this holy line? Where is it? We don't have to look far. Just go to the Bible. We'll look there. Romans 11.5, I want you to go there with me. Proud of this, I've just only given references to scripture. I'd like for you to go with me to Romans chapter five. Okay. Uh, Romans, uh, no, 11, by the way, I'm sorry. Romans 11. And in Romans 11, um, I'd like for you to zero in on verse five, Romans 11. And there in verse five, it says, even so at this present time, at what time? Right now, as you and I are here, there is a what? A remnant according to the will of man. Is that what it says? According to the election of grace. What grace? The same grace that we have traced all the way from Adam down to our time. There's an election. But it says here, even so. That word even so, if you're reading your King James, other versions will put it this way. In the same way. In what same way? What is the context? Oh. Look at, um, this, is, this is Elijah talking with God. And we heard uh, a story of Elijah not too long ago in a sermon. And it says here in verse three, Elijah is talking to God in the cave. Oh, a a Alvin was preaching this sermon. And he says, Lord, they have killed your prophets. They've digged down your altars. I, I, even I, I am left alone and they are seeking my life. You see, even in the days of Elijah, the devil still wanted to kill. That's, that's what he's always wanted to do. Okay, and he says here, and he says, and I only am left, and they are seeking to destroy me, Lord. <laughs> Elijah was a man of life passion, just like you and I. He's trying to actually get God to understand this, as if he doesn't understand, right? Don't you understand, Lord? They're trying to kill me. You need to do something. What did God say? But what says the answer of God to him? Notice, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal, uh, 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 or, or even, you know, uh, or, or who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, you know, Baal worship is still present today, guys. And this is for another sermon some other day. So I'm not even going to touch on that. But Baal worship is still happening today. Baal worship is still happening today. He showed that to the prophet Ezekiel. Men and women in Christian churches with their backs from the front of the church and they're facing the east, worshiping the sun. 
There's much to be said about that, but that's another sermon for another time. But we're told in the same way, just like he told Elijah, there is a remnant according to the lack of grace. Now, guys, I want to say this real quickly. When you think of a remnant uh, in the same way, just like Elijah, a remnant, just like Elijah's time, we think of uh, Elijah, we wonder what he was like. You know, we're not told much about Elijah himself. We're told much about his mission. But when John the Baptist came on the scene, Christ said, that is Elijah. And when we study the life of John, we see a lot that was common with Elijah. And from Christ's inference, we know that John the Baptist was a lot like Elijah. Now, so even though we don't know about much about Elijah studying through Elijah's story, yet we know much about him as we look about the, at the story of John. We know about his lifestyle. We know about his preaching. We know about his fearless uh, ness in reproving sin. We know that he was a baptizer, okay? We know also that he was a uh, uh, um, preparer of the way of the Messiah. We know that he was persecuted and we know that he was a martyr, okay? Now, Elijah was all of these except a baptizer and he wasn't martyred. But we know that he, was, he could have been martyred if God would have, for, except that God had chosen to take him home to heaven, okay? Because Jezebel was looking for him to kill him, all right? So we know that. So, um, so in verse five, even so, at this present time, there's a remnant. Where is that remnant? Well, go with me to a familiar verse. Revelation chapter 12. This is what Chrysanna read to us this morning. Revelation 12 and verse 17. Okay, my friends, obviously it goes without saying, as you look at the story from the fall till the present time throughout history, you want, if you had lived back then, any one of us would have wanted to be a part of the Holy Line. You wouldn't have wanted to be, even if you lived in, in, in Israel, do, do you know that shortly after the kingdoms, the, the two kingdoms were divided, that those who wish to worship the true God actually came from Israel and went to Judah to worship. They actually left their country and they went to Judah and that's where they went to worship. We're gonna see as we close that that's exactly what God is planning to do in these last days, okay? In Revelation 12, 17, the dragon, who is the devil, was wroth, that means mad, okay? Not just upset, he's mad with the woman. Who's the woman? Represents a church in the book of Revelation, okay? but it's not with a woman, with the woman. So it's a particular woman, okay? It's the same woman that is the seed, that, 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 that is the, a symbol of the true church, okay? And it says here, and went to make war, notice this now, with the remnant of her seed. And here we're told they keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You can't miss it. You can't miss it. Even if you didn't know who these were, if you just said, you know what? Okay, that's what it is. All right, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to keep all of God's commandments, and I'm going to find out what this testimony of Jesus, and I'm going to find out what it is, and I'll keep it. In Revelation 19.10, we won't go there. Write it down if you've never seen it. We're told that the angel says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So reading with that uh, uh, definition furnished to us, it says here that the remnant keep the commandments of God, and they have the spirit of prophecy. Well, saints, what is the spirit of prophecy? Not too long ago, I talked about this. Adam and God and Eve and his wife had open communion with God before they fell. They actually spoke with him face to face as you speak with a friend. Imagine what that was like. God showed up and they went and they talked face to face without a dimming veil in between. When, the, when they fell from their high place, that could no longer happen. That could no longer happen. And so now a way of communication was opened up whereby man could still speak with God, even though not face to face. That way of communication was the spirit of prophecy. From the very beginning, God would speak to people now through prophets. Okay, so this is the spirit of, prof of the prophets. Now, and I wanna say something about this uh, uh, in, in a little bit here. Um, this, we already know that the devil hates 
prophecy and we know why. First of all, it exposes his plans in the future and it enables people to be ready. He doesn't like that. No enemy wants you to know what they're going to do. You know, nations spend lots of money trying to understand what the other nation is trying to do. You know, every once in a while we hear of people who are arrested trying to get information or people who are arrested for treason trying to give information to other people. They're trying to figure out what are you trying to do? You know, I, I was watching something on the Second World War over here and that's what they were doing over there. You know, uh, Hitler was succeeding and all of that. And at one time Britain began to learn how to decode uh, some of their plans so that they would know ahead of time what they were going to do. Well, God, through the spirit of prophecy, has given us this amazing gift to be able to know what our, what our enemy is doing. And you know what? He doesn't know what we're doing, <laughs> but we know what he's doing. That's what makes him angry. Okay? Now, during the time of a black horse period, this gift of prophecy you know, it's, it's a gift just like all the rest was taken away by God. This gift was taken away. In other words, you don't see it prominently in the church anywhere. You don't see, like we read of the church in Antioch, there were several prophets. There were prophets everywhere. They, you know, Philip the Evangelist had, you know, seven daughters. They're all prophets. I mean, you, you don't hear anything like that today, except the false prophets who, you know, a couple of them were telling us, that, you know, told us they, they just knew Trump. Trump is going to win. God has shown them. Well, we know now that they're from false prophets. So we're not talking about those. We're talking about genuine prophets. I want to say something here in closing. I want you to go um, two more scriptures we have, and then we'll close. We'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and then we'll end with Acts 2. Go there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Okay? <coughs> and um, go there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I hope this is making sense. But when you get to chapter one, notice what uh, Paul begins to say in verse four. And what we really want is verses six and seven, but we want four and five for context, okay? It says here, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given unto you by Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, I really thank God for something here, for the grace of God revealed in some way. Notice this, that in everything, you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. And now notice the two verses in question. Even as the what? Testimony of Jesus Christ was confirmed in you. Now we know that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Paul singles this out. And he says, you are so enriched that the testimony of Jesus Christ was enriched in you. Okay, notice, who, of whom is he talking? Now notice so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about, he's talking, addressing the last day church. That the last day church will have uh, as the most prominent among its gifts, uh, the spirit of prophecy will be confirmed in those constituting the bookend of this long line of holy men and women. It will be one. In fact, it, it is picked. It is selected from all the gifts that God gives because there really is no question as to whether there is a gift of pastors. There is no question as to whether we have the gift of teachers. There is no gift that there are a, 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 a controversy over there being evangelists. We know that. We know people have given people the gift of helps and administrations. There's no controversy over that. But the one thing that is missing in the Christian church today is this spirit of prophecy. And when I say spirit of prophecy, I mean, you don't see people, uh, uh, you know, here and there, it's not the general practice where you see people just prophesying, prophets here and there. We don't know of any, except for the writings of Mrs. White, which many think that is the spirit of prophecy. You know, Sister White had the, the spirit of prophecy. She had the gift of prophecy. She had it, she was one of them, but she, she's not the one. Okay, any more than Jeremiah is the spirit of prophecy or any one of those prophets is the spirit of prophecy. She is one of them, but she is not the only one. Amen. Now, so, um, but this gift is so important. I want to close with something that cannot fail to bring this out. We're going to go to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. 
Go there with me. Okay, in Acts chapter 2, go with me to verse 17. I'm going to show you something here. Okay, in these verses, we have the prominent signs of the last day given to us. Okay, and among these prominent and unique signs of the last day, we have the gift of prophecy mentioned as being revived then. Okay, now notice this. It says here, and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And you, your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Visions and dreams are the province of prophets. Okay? So it's talking about the one gift. I'm going to pour out my spirit. And when my spirit is poured out, this is how you will know. That your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And young men will see visions. Young men like George, young men like Munga, young men like Chrysanne, all these young men, like, you know, all, they will see visions. What does that make them when they see visions? God says, if there is a prophet among you, I myself will make known myself known to them through visions and dreams. Okay, so God is going to revive this. Now notice this, and, and on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. That means all the girls, the little girls that you're teaching, all these young people, God, every one of them is going to be able to do. Okay? Now, now notice this. Verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and the signs in the earth beneath. Notice blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and dreadful of the day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass whoso, that whosoever shall call, call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What am I trying to say? The spirit of prophecy here is classed with those prominent and unique signs of the last day in the sun and the moon and the stars and other wonders in the heavens above and blood and smoke and all of that and everything on the earth. It is classed with them. In other words, when you see these things, this is the gift that is going to be prominent among my people. In other words, okay, we can put two things together. During the great apostasy, this gift was taken away. Why was it taken away? Because people compromised. It's the result of the compromise in Christianity that this gift was taken away. Because this gift is a powerful gift, and it can be misused by people who are in apostasy. So God took it away. All right? You, you can imagine all of the pains that were caused the real prophets by the false prophets in the Old Testament. And you can see why God can take it away. Okay, all you have today is false prophets. Okay, now, so it has been absent, this gift, since the time of the great apostasy, uh, because of the unbelief and the, and the errors and the, and, 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 and of the church. Okay, so we can deduce or infer that when God's people again attain to primitive godliness, as they most surely will, this gift will be revived. It will be revived. When was it revived for the apostles? This apostles who in the upper room, they weren't talking to each other. They were looking for the highest place and all of that. They were in the same place more or less that Laodicea finds itself today. People jostling for the highest positions. The things that we're talking about, the things that obsess and absorb uh, 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 our absorb our time in our general conference sessions and all of that is all about who's going to lead who, who's going to lead over, who can It's those things. Who is going to have the highest position? But these men, when Christ on the Mount of Olives says, go back to Jerusalem, don't leave. Go to the upper room and don't leave until the Holy Spirit came down, comes down to you. They knew exactly what to do. They prayed for 10 days. They made things right. You know, uh, envy was taken away. Jealousy was taken away. Unforgiveness was put away. Your know, people made it right. They were specific. They came to each other and they made it right. They made it right their relationship with, with God and with one another. And at the end of 10 days, the Bible tells us unequivocally that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord and in one place. Now we may not be in one physical place, but we can be in one place when we agree with one another and with God. We agree with God first and the result is that we agree with one another. When that happened, 
they were all in one accord in one place. When the Holy Spirit came down, the spirit of prophecy was revived among them. And when we do the same, when we attain to this level of godliness, this primitive godliness that God is looking for, the Bible says, without a doubt, this gift, this gift will be revived. And when this gift is revived, the devil will go forth to make war. He will be wroth with a woman and go forth because he will see that. The reason why you don't see persecution today it's not because we're not keeping God's commandments, we're doing that, but there's two things. The testimony of Jesus Christ, he hasn't seen that. When that happens, my friends, persecution will be waged against God's people. When that happens, what's happening? Remember what I told you, and I'll close with this. Israel would actually leave their country and go to Judah to worship. That's what they did. If you read the book of Isaiah, I want you, when you go home to read this, Isaiah chapter, three, chapter two, verses three and four, we're told that in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established up in the mountains and it will be exalted above the hills. And it will come to pass that all nations will flow into it. And it will come to pass that they will say, come, let us go to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his path. And then it ends by saying this, for out of Zion will go forth the law and the word of God from Jerusalem. So, so there's going to be this light that attracts people to come to God's people. And this light is not there quite yet. Why? Because you and I need to begin to plead God to revive us. Revive me, God. When I am revived, you will be able to know. And when you're revived, I'll be able to know. Well, my friends, that brings me to an end of what all I had to do. Babe, how, how did I do? Beautiful. Okay. All right. um, I'm asking how I did in time because I, I tend to go too far and I, and, and I was hoping that I wouldn't do that. Uh, I hope and pray that you have been blessed. Um, and I hope that, um, you know, you are inspired to uh, uh, continue to be faithful. Uh, you are a part of a great worldwide movement. Okay. And just because there is a name and you call yourself an Adventist uh, doesn't mean that everyone who calls themselves an Adventist is, is, a, is, a, is a member of this holy line. You know, there was the whole house of Judah and only we see uh, sometimes there was only one person and that hung on the balance. I'm going to encourage you to be faithful. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for coming to bless us this morning. I pray, Lord, and I hope that they were, the people were blessed as they listened to a familiar story. Uh, and I ask, Heavenly Father, that uh, most earnestly, Lord, uh, we could see that the greatest need is one of revival. We need to be revived, Lord. We can't just be like everybody else and hope that when you bless us like nobody else, that we will be blessed like no one else. So I pray, Lord, that you would, um, you would help us to see that. I pray, Lord, that um, you would speak to each and every one of us, to each and every one of our hearts. I pray, Lord, that we can be you can lead us to be faithful to your Lord, even when we think we are alone like Elijah. Because, Lord, that man felt himself alone. But, Father, we, can, we have seen how you can bless one person so much that, you know, while he was sitting there, uh, a chariot came and took him home. You blessed him. You care about what one person is doing. You care that one person is faithful. So I pray that that person will be me. And I, I hope that everyone who is listening to my prayer can say that about themselves. Thank you so much. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for the sermon. Praise the Lord of the George. <clears throat> Praise God. That's all I have to say. Hi, everyone. Amen. Amen. I want to um, see if I can get people to sign up for next month's um, bulletin. Um, it's basically wide open. So <laughs> if anybody wants to sign up, um, maybe next we'll start with next week. Um, Crystal. Yes. I can do my exhortation next week. I, I found it right after George was talking about, you know, it's okay that we missed it. So I okay. guess the, 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 the devil was busy. So I can do mine next week. Thank you. Um, Ati Carrie, you went?
Okay. Did you do the children's story, Ati Carrie, mm -hmm. which Sabbath? Mm -hmm. Okay, I still got to turn the one back. Ati Carrie? She's, she's muted. Oh, you're on mute, Ate. Can't hear you. Okay. Yeah. 